There's a lot to be said about unapologetically single-player games like Atomic Heart. Its entire focus is on creating an intricate world for us to explore and discover for ourselves. A killer chicken. Now I've seen it all. An eye-catching blend of super-powered shooting and first-person puzzling, this is a lengthy, tough and terrific-looking shooter that has us bathing in the blood and gears of elaborately designed enemies, both biological and robotic, and dispatching them with an impressive set of combat options. How about this? Granted, it's not as clever as it thinks it is when dealing with melee combat or its typical fetch quests, and the story doesn't quite stick its landing, but the journey from point A to point B is a sight to behold. Isn't there supposed to be a radio in here? Atomic Heart is an alternate history shooter cut from the same cloth as Bioshock and Machine Games' Wolfenstein series. It's a kind of retro-futuristic romp back to an imagined past perverted by ridiculously advanced technology. A world where science has made the supernatural a reality and robots are now running rife. These are far from the only shooters Atomic Heart is unafraid to crib from, either. Half-Life and the puzzle-solving of Portal are also clear inspirations, and there's been an attempted sprinkling of Arkane's successful brand of first-person stealth, too. However, it'd be unfair to call Atomic Heart wholly derivative despite such recognisable building blocks. Certainly, the idea of a peaceful utopia torn to pieces thanks to technology turning on its ambitious masters is nothing new. But developer Mundfish has assembled its vision in a confident and compelling way, and the art team here well and truly understood the assignment. The most remarkable element here is the superb visual design, especially the look of these well-crafted enemies. Let me go, you son of a bitch! Its range of robots is particularly strong, from its sleek and sinister mustachioed terminators that charge at us without ever reverting their gaze, to its pot-belly parking meters with mouth tubes that make them look like they're sucking at the drawstring on an invisible jacket. Its featureless ballerina bots and spindly-legged battle balls are equally memorable, the latter of which are probably best described as scaled-down Eastern Bloc knockoffs of those things that couldn't kill Mr. Incredible. There's even one that looks like Baymax cosplaying as a tank. Atomic Heart's outstanding aesthetic also extends to its large range of partially ruined labs, facilities and transportation hubs, each filled with long, snaking globules of the liquid polymer that powers the advancements of this fantastical 1950s. That said, there is a distinct feeling of look-don't-touch in these places. There's definitely a lack of destructibility. Balloons immune to axe swings are probably the worst offenders. But the level of detail overall is strikingly good. There are some especially tiny touches in Atomic Heart that smack of a great deal of consideration, like the way there are different reload animations for unspent magazines compared to empty ones, the latter of which are flicked away while the former are grasped by the same hand sliding a fresh one in. Watching them play out is a pleasure, which is why it was a bit annoying that my HUD was sometimes cluttered with pickup notifications and health bars for minibosses no longer in the area that froze on screen until I reloaded from a recent save. But why is it stuck there like that? And I've experienced some uneven quality when it comes to graphical glitches as I've played on Xbox Series X. The worst is a terrible strobing effect on some fast-moving robots running circuits around a large room, and the frame rate tanks if you ride them but fortunately it seems mostly isolated to certain bot types. I've had no such problems with similarly nimble and often much larger bosses. Atomic Heart is naturally all tinted with the Soviet-era iconography you'd probably expect from a land tucked deep behind the Iron Curtain in the mid-1950s. And admittedly, the lens through which you may view all this Soviet symbolism is a little different today in 2023 than it was upon its announcement and first reveal back in 2018. Everyone here seems so happy and content. Of course, having grown up geographically isolated and politically irrelevant in the Southern Hemisphere, largely detached from Cold War concerns and raised on Bond movies, Stripes and Rocky IV, I must break you. My read on such an overtly Russian backdrop is guaranteed to be markedly different to someone with roots in Eastern Europe. For its part, however, the background does largely fade away as Atomic Heart peels back the layers of its false utopia. At this stage, Facility 3826 and the 
countryside of rural Russia isn't much different to the likes of Bioshock's Rapture itself. That is, a place more or less cut off from the outside world where something has gone deeply, deeply wrong. Ugh, this tunnel's messed up. Exploring exactly what's gone wrong is the job of our character, Special Forces veteran Major Sergei Necheyev. Welcome, Comrade Major! Or P3, as he's dubbed throughout. The foul-mouthed and amnestic P3 is admittedly a bit of a relic of games gone by, and his default English-language voiceover doesn't exactly do him a lot of favours. He comes off as the cookie-cutter American lead of every second shooter ever made. No time for a dirt nap, Stuck. Get your ass up and head to cover. However, it's the script that really does him a greater disservice. While I'll happily admit swearing is virtually my second language, P3 spews it with the gusto of a teenage boy testing every curse word he's recently learned twice a sentence. I need some parts to upgrade my weapon. I won't get far with this pile of shit. It's a little exhausting, and the presence of many modern turns of phrase don't exactly help keep the overall experience seated in the 1950s. You dickhead. Of course, perhaps I'm being a little hypocritical in demanding consistency there, because the regularly ruthless soundtrack packed with headbangers courtesy of Doom and Wolfenstein composer Mick Gordon isn't exactly a sonic journey back to the days of doo-wop either, and yet the music is pitch perfect as far as I'm concerned. At any rate, there is a Russian language English subtitle option for purists, but I would have simply preferred an English script that was more tempered for the setting and era. Watch your language, Major. There are well over 20 odd hours of play here in the main story thread alone, with many more available in the side objectives, some of which border on crucial if you actually want the best weapons. Some of that is padding, but it's a good length overall, and nicely inside that not too short, not too long Goldilocks zone for a great solo shooter. There are also two endings you can get based on just one choice you make in the finale, although after seeing both I found the first anticlimactic and don't think the second was worth the reload. First, you'll need a substantial glove upgrade. Report to the lab. However, while P3 is disappointingly threadbare as a character, he's nonetheless very capable and entertaining to play as, largely thanks to his partner Charles, who is a talking glove. Hey, glove. My name is Charles, comrade major. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, that's a bit reductive. Rather, Charles is basically an intelligent system embedded in P3 who is capable of granting him seemingly supernatural abilities, manifested by a set of small squid-like tentacles that extend from a glove on P3's left hand. This not only includes activating an X-ray style view of your surroundings and tossing certain small objects a la Half-Life 2's iconic gravity gun, but also the ability to fire bolts of electricity or ice, levitate enemies into the air to shoot or slam into the ground, or even summon a temporary shield. Akin to Bioshock's plasmids, these abilities add an important layer of more interesting combat on top of Atomic Heart's otherwise fairly typical blasting and slightly clumsy melee combat. There's a great sense of weight when beaming a bot in the brain pan with an axe, and the gouges that appear across their bodies in real time is a great touch. But I found the weapon swinging too slow and frustrating when swarmed by too many enemies simultaneously. The juggling act of defeating dense swarms of robots, as well as the blender-sized hovering repair bots that continually swoop in to magically resurrect them, gets a bit wearisome at times, especially above ground. Atomic Heart's linear underground sequences are linked by a decent-sized slab of open world, where we're free to explore and fight wherever we wish. And this zone is initially a nice antidote to the more corralled corridor segments that progress the story or reward us with useful upgrades. However, with their long line of sight and overwhelming numbers, I often found myself running or driving away from fights rather than diving in and trying to get the upper hand by stealth before attacking. The robot hordes become a little less intimidating as P3 and his arsenal grow stronger throughout the story, but that's a process that takes some time. Unlocking and upgrading these abilities requires a steady supply of resources, which the levels and defeated enemies are generally chock full of, even if collecting them can become a bit of a chore. Atomic Heart is smart to keep this process fast by allowing us to extend out a hand and suck up reams of resources like an industrial shop vac, but it still becomes a little tedious having to ransack the same sets of desks and cabinets arranged slightly differently in a hundred or so different rooms. 
Tedious 2 is Atomic Heart's overly ambitious attempt to weasel its way out of accountability for leaning on some extremely hackneyed fetch quests. Having the main character cynically gripe and complain about collecting four canisters for a bafflingly unintuitive door locking mechanism that would never get past any sensible architectural committee isn't a free pass to proceed with it. So every other day you gotta run around collecting four different canisters? What a pain in the ass. The main character being annoyed for the same reason I am isn't cute. It's a tone-deaf non-apology for weak game design. Who the hell came up with all this shit? It's a shame that some better context wasn't baked around these occasional fetch quests because Atomic Heart's underground chambers feel like a ripe opportunity and are largely great otherwise. Eerie, deadly and mostly devoid of life. Unless you count the mutant freaks with skulls shattered into fanged floral arrangements or the dead bodies that communicate via the confused ramblings of their fading brain implants. What are you talking about? It does rely too heavily on repeating the same handful of door lock minigames that serve no real purpose other than to arbitrarily slow your progression from room to room. Ugh, supply room's locked. But I do like the bespoke platforming puzzle chambers and one-off brain teasers especially the clever visual puzzle you'll encounter late during your trip to an ornate theatre full of robotic performers. Our brief guided tour is coming to an end. Atomic Heart is a deeply ambitious, highly imaginative and consistently impressive Adam Punk inspired attempt at picking up where the likes of Bioshock left off, something it's done with a lot of success. It certainly makes missteps, chiefly with an irritating leading man and a self-indulgent habit of using the same tired tropes it tries to make fun of. I'm a magnet for annoying bullshit. But this stern, super-powered and stringently solo shooter has worked its way under my skin despite these flaws. Atomic Heart didn't always blow me away, but it definitely has the ticker to punch well above its weight. For more recent verdicts, check out our reviews for Metroid Prime Remastered and Like a Dragon Ishin. For everything else, stick with IGN. You have